So the first question was about uh, role of PR in content strategy. Uh, and, and that was something that I was asked this last week and I gave my thoughts on that goal, but I thought it'd be interesting to hear what you also had to say. Um, so Nemanja, what, what do you think PR needs to be involved? Is it something that's necessary? Is it a nice to have? Uh, should companies pay for it? Is it worth the money that it, um, that it costs? What are your thoughts on PR in B2B? Yeah, I'll use an example uh, of, the, of the client that I work with. <laughs> Um, so their goal is to uh, become the number one the go-to place for the startups in uh, Western Balkans. And uh, how are they going to do that? They hired us. So that's the first thing they did. So they're organizing a bunch, bunch of events already in talks with startups. They have the Acceleration Startups Program. They are known here in the environment as one of the let's say five organizations that are working towards that goal that is actually creating the, the startup ecosystem working with uh, gender diverse founders working with female founders like bringing venture capital uh, here to this region and taking startups to the, to the markets of scale and it was all good like we we did some traction we did some good things but then like i said stop uh it gives results but like the the biggest organizations that are working towards that goal are not involving you when they mention like the startup ecosystem when they mention the biggest player then don't mention you for some reason and uh you are organizing each week like two or three events all of them fully insightful, uh, really great, with great information for the, for the startups, for the founders, and for the community overall. And what happens, nobody hears about that because you don't want to share recordings, you don't share uh, some of the conclusions from those events, and people cannot know what's going on, what are your actual results. I mean, we just talking about it, it's okay, but it's not enough if you want to be number one when it go to a uh, place when it comes to the startups. So uh, I said, let's change the, let's add something to the strategy and let's add the P somebody who will be in charge of the PR. So we need to be involved in like huge portals, uh, huge media um, news, in some things, you know, all the things that are uh, connected with the startup ecosystem, with the startups that has anything to do with, with business because it's, it's, it's not a huge community. And uh, when, we, when we start doing that, things change a little bit because we are now more involved in the news. People get to know us like the guy who is uh, chief revenue uh, is in charge of chief revenue operations over there. Uh, is also one of the 30 under 30 people, young people in business. Um, all uh, because of the PR. So we start growing, and uh, I just use this example to to say that I think it's necessary. But uh, it's not like the PR that we used to do in like five years ago. We need to create something uh, and then take it uh, to the to the media. So we need to. Uh, how do we do that? Like, if we if we are doing it just for the hoping that uh, sending the, the email to all the publishers will do the work, it won't, because they will just one will publish the news other ones will copy you don't get the links from those portals somebody will see it somebody won't uh, and you actually get nothing but you need to get deeper to really connect to people who are uh, news reporters people who are writing those things who are working in in those uh, those media you need to connect with them especially those that are writing uh, specifically for your niche and uh, 
then you do that, it's sort of like looking for a client or looking for new employees. You need to get in touch with them. Also, one of the good things that you can do for the publicity, just remember that, I thought it's uh, okay if I mention it, is organizing events and inviting all your competitors and all the publishers to your event. That's the way you get uh, the traction for your event, for your, for your brand, for your company, because they came to your event. They don't have a choice except to write about it. So those are just some, some thoughts about, about it. It's, it's necessary, and if you want to go big and really grow, you need to have it. I, I personally disagree with that. I, I don't think uh, PR is necessary at all. I think it's nice to have if you have a lot of budget. But for me, PR is a sign of a failed content marketing strategy. I think if a, a good content marketing strategy creates the benefit of, of what pre PR brings to the table, plus adds other benefits that I, I'll, I'll touch on that PR cannot achieve. So I think if you're able to, in, in my opinion, uh, marketing is a game of attention. And back in the day, attention was concentrated in the big PR publishing firms, right? Like it was, if you can publish on Forbes, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an Inc. magazine, that's where you, uh, that's where people are consuming the attention. Like that's where you have to be for people to know about you and for people to be aware of your brand. But I think that has been democratized over the last few years. And it has changed to the point where you don't need a PR agency to put you on Forbes or Entrepreneur. You can create as much or way more attention. You can create as much or way more community, brand loyalty, and own your, own your audience. If you're publishing on Twitter, if you're publishing on LinkedIn, if you're publishing on Medium, if you have an email list. I think those are ways that you can create the same effects of PR at a much lower cost and in a way that's actually organic because you don't have to pay for somebody to accept you. I, I really believe in self-sufficiency of can you make it yourself without needing somebody to give you access. If you need access for Forbes to say, okay, you're good enough to be published or you have enough money, then it just means that your content strategy on these other channels that I mentioned is not good enough or not generating traction. Um, I think at the end of the day, PR, getting your name out there is like the only benefit is the credibility that it brings. Like being able to say, I was published on Forbes or I was published somewhere else. But if you actually go and click on the articles, like you can see how many views these articles are getting. And they're getting like 200 views, 250 views. Like 80% of the articles get under a thousand views. So you get much more exposure if you're publishing yourself versus paying 2000 3000 4000 5000 dollars cuz this is like the minimum retainers for a PR agency um, plus you don't get to track who's uh, consuming the content they don't follow you etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but in terms of credibility it it doesn't show credibility if you can buy it right like if i can pay you a thousand dollars to say that i'm great then that your opinion is not credible anymore so I don't know if that's because a lot of CEOs and business owners and marketers don't know that you can buy for, pay for access to these PR firms and so that they can publish you on Forbes. But to me, there's no credibility in being on Forbes if you had to pay. That just shows that you have $5,000 in the bank to get there. Um, so, so in my opinion, PR is something that you can have eventually for like one, two, three or four posts to have there and to be able to show some sort of credibility, but it's not a big component of content marketing strategy if you're doing the rest of the things right. Yeah, I totally agree. I think we are just talking about um, same things, but in a different manner. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, that's why I give the example. Like the example says that you need to, um, create a relationship with somebody from the media so you can get, get that exposure to. And it's important if you want to be number one, you need to have that aspect too. I mean, everything else is working. You're creating the brand. Like I'm, I was talking about the company that people know here. They right. know them. They have also the co-working spaces. They have the community. They are involved in mentors, leaders, but outside of that bubble, 
people don't know about them. And there are so many like uh, founders, business businessmen, other people who like like me, who are receiving only one newspaper per month on their address and only one talking relevant talking about business. That's it. This is the one. So there are some some kind of things like that, and I totally agree with you. Like, uh, if uh, people don't know about you, and you need to get to the to the PR part so people can know about you, it's it's a failed content strategy and personal branding and everything else that you are doing. But if it's just an addition to that, that's already a different story. Yeah. It- I think, like you said, we're agreeing on the same thing, but I started my agency doing a lot of content creation for personal brands because part of it was the frustration of PR, right? Like I learned, I was talking to a lot of people in the PR world and I would realize that that's a failed system. Like once you get in like deep into it, um, I don't know that's much in, in Serbia and all that, but in the United States, it's basically like, are you like leaking the reporter's ass and are you like paying them money and uh, and it's money under the table because it's not supposed to be a thing that you can pay the reporter for for publishing um so it's really very frustrating to see how pr works and my opinion was like let's build a pr firm for the 21st century where you don't need forbes where you don't need entrepreneur uh, when you can create a podcast instead of having a tv show when you can write on medium and get more exposure than you would ever get on forbes so I, I even thought about like calling Influence Podium like the anti-PR PR agency because I was really frustrated with PR. And, and I do think if you can own it, if you can build your Twitter following, build your LinkedIn following, create a community, um, then you can go to Forbes and say, look, I have all these people following me. Let me write for you. And they'll want to write. They'll, they'll ask you to write for them versus you having to go the other way and paying $10,000 for an article that... 200 people watch it or, or read it. Um, so for me, like, like you said, if it's an addition, okay, I'll buy it. Like if you're a big company and you want to have a few placements, like go ahead, invest in that. But if you are like a company that is at least mindful of their budget, like, or, or wants to invest in doing things organically, and I'll go as far as even saying ethically, if you want to do things ethically, like actually create a content strategy that organically be into the community because your content's good enough. If you have to buy for it, then I think it's a long-term losing strategy. Yeah, all good points. I mean, I want to give an example. How did I uh, started creating my brand and everything else? Like I was somebody from a small city and I couldn't get invitation for the for the biggest marketing and business conferences as a speaker. So, I mean, they knew about me, but I wasn't in front of their eyes as somebody who they would invite. Like, they didn't know how much do I know or something. Maybe they, they did, but, you know, people who are closer, who are living in bigger cities, on the bigger markets. Uh, so, when I, when I come to Novi Sad, when I move here, um, I involved with... Uh, with the biggest IT organization that actually created the IT community. And they have like eight, I think it's eight co-working centers around the, around the country. So uh, I got invited as a speaker on one, then the other one called me and then all the others called me. So I went around the country, just like getting to know my country and uh, speaking doing workshops, doing speeches on specific topics. And uh, when my first client came, like as a, as a funky marketing, like 80% of them saw me at one of those events. Right. Some of them, some of them saw the, the videos, but also the other, I get to know the organizers of the conferences because they came to my lectures. So I got invited to also to speak, those kind of things. And it just, way around and there's one more example this one is cool i think you'll like it because there's alcohol involved <laughs> <laughs> is that my is that my brand is that the yeah, alcohol yeah. my brand Damn. so look in 2013 i was a well-known uh youth worker and an activist and i got invited 
to a conference in Republic of Macedonia, Khrushchev, as yeah. one of 60 people from Western Balkans, like youth leaders. And uh, I was going there by train all night traveling and I brought like the bottle of Rakia because that's what you do when you are coming from Serbia to an event. And during the night, like I was in coupe with, with uh, a few other people and they told me like, it smells like, like Rakia, is that yours? No, my is safe. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when I, when I reached out the destination, it's a, it's a hotel on a, on a mountain, like almost um, 2000 meters. And it's cold, end of September. Yeah. So uh, I figure out I don't have anything to wear because it all smells like, like rakia. <laughs> like the, all of my stuff, like whole bottle is on them. So I just took one t-shirt that is uh, that smells the least. Yeah. And we have the opening uh, like 9.30 at night just like two hours from the time when we arrived and I was hanging out uh, in hotel and like telling what what actually happened so when we started this the opening ceremony um, the pronouncing name of each participant you come to the stage you t say a few sentences about you and then like that's it you know yeah. they know who you are and like all of them, people didn't know who are those people. And when they called my name, like applause, like <laughs> all 60, 70 people. And the organizers were like, who the hell is this guy? Everybody knows him. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's Rakia. So, and uh, I ended up uh, being in charge of the marketing for the conference for the next four years. Only that was the starting point, like sort yeah. of a PR. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think um, like PR has switched and, and there's, it just has been democratized, right? Like right now I look at it like, like if you were running TV ads, like why are you doing that? There's better ways to do that and are more expensive and give you better data and all that. So that's how I look at PR right now, um, which I'm not saying never works. I'm saying in, in most cases, I would not invest in it. Um, there's, there's another question that I got this week that I wanted to ask you, which was, uh, there's two more. The first one was, um, this writer, uh, Vasilena asked me, uh, she was writing a, an absolute guide on how to grow a podcast in the early days of its existence. So first month, first to three to three months, uh, what are you doing, um, to, what can you do to help grow the podcast? And what are some of the things that you should be thinking at if you, you or your company wants to start a podcast, an interview series, uh, a YouTube show, some f long form pillar content, what can you do to bring the most exposure, get the most value and use it the most effectively for your company or for yourself? What did you answer? So I, I answered a couple of different things. Um, I actually don't remember because I sent a voice note, so I, I wish I wrote <laughs> it down. Um, my biggest thing, well, I, I mentioned a couple of different things. First, there's a lot of podcasts out there, and I think it's very important to niche down, right? And, and to like really cover a very specific set of your market who uh, is very loyal to that specific thing versus trying to cover too many things, right? I think that's one of the things that I did wrong on my podcast. If the goal is to get as many listeners as possible, my podcast right now is too broad. I, like it's about entrepreneurship, it's about B2B CEOs, but we don't really find uh, anything there other than giving a space to share their story. Uh, so, so niching down and being very niche is, is important. I think um, I said, but, but the biggest thing is to change the perception of how, how you're using the podcast and what objectives are you going after and what KPIs are you tracking. So I mentioned that uh, the, the most important KPI, at least for me, is not how many listeners do I get. I actually have never checked that. Like, I don't know how many. It can be, like, I might have an audience of 100,000 people. I have no idea. Because um, that's not what's important to me. What, what's important to me is two other things that come with a podcast and that she was not considering 
and that a lot of people don't consider when you're going just after how many listeners, uh, which is one, the relationship with your guest, right? Uh, the, I came from Barcelona to, to the States. Now I'm back in Barcelona. When I started the business, I had no network. Like I knew zero people. M- my way to create a network around me was to create content and to invite them as guests and actually build a relationship. Uh, we've sent a few clients from, from the podcast, which is a great ROI, but I never do it to sell. I do it to actually create a relationship with somebody that can last me 40 years, which for me is more valuable. And, and then second, if, if you actually want to listen, like get more listeners on the podcast, they're not going to listen to the full episode. They're going to listen to like s- a smaller pieces of it. So using the podcast as a Trojan horse for content creation, I think that's where the real value is. Um, when, when you're creating a pillar piece of content, so repurposing it into articles, into LinkedIn content, Twitter content, basically what we're doing right now, right? Like trying to like utilize this as a way to build community, as a build, way to build content. Um, how many people listen is a the cherry on top. And for most people, that's not the metric that they should go after or that should um, direct their actions either. Totally agree. Totally agree. I mean, that is, that was the reason why we started the the podcast. And um, I mean, yesterday I also uh, answered the question. But like every company now has a podcast. Everybody has a podcast. Should you do it? Can you be unique? And my answer is, it's not about being unique. It's about the reason why you are doing it. So. Right. Uh, First one is to provide value, to uh, actually share some things that you have experienced, some things that you are working on, to share some thoughts, maybe get some answers since we are having a discussion and share that with the world, like distributing those things that you are saying because we are in a way going through all stages just of the the buyer's journey here because we are talk, we are covering a lot of topics connected to the B2B and uh, also by doing that by uh, answering questions no matter if it's our questions or somebody else's question uh, we are we are actually getting right to the, to the point so giving giving value and engaging people not only while we are recording but also when we are distributing it like as a, as a video as audiogram no matter what is the the context about it sometimes we'll share a quote but also um, about uh, those things that we are answering here are some things that uh, are uh, not so unique like Every entrepreneur, somebody who is in marketing, who is running an agency, somebody who is uh, trying to grow a personal brand, they're all going through the same things. And basically, we, we get our uniqueness, you and I, by talking about uh, the things related to our businesses and experiences of how we are growing it. Somebody gets to listen from the first episode up to this one, which is like 13th they will see how we are developing, how we are growing, how we are changing the way we think, right? So I think that is, that is also uh, one of the biggest values. And we didn't even start distributing the main, the main content here, the main content pillar, so the episodes. We did uh, a little bit uh, of that. So like Funky Marketing YouTube is grown a little bit. People are... Um, are listening like there are, there are five or six hours a week of people listening to to these things so it's it gives value to people and also just like yesterday we started uh, we started actually promoting the audio as as really a podcast so um, it's also a journey of how we are developing this thing we started as just conversation between you and me and now as far as i'm seeing it sometimes there are more people with us while we are recording it sometimes it's less but there are people who are here every week and like no matter if it's one person like 
that person is coming. Guys, some of you are coming each week to, to listen to us. And I'm very grateful for that. Even if it's one person, it's still something that keeps, keeps me going to come back here and share something. Yeah. Also, because we're not selling anything, right? Like, I think that's, that's an important thing that people misconstrue. Like, you don't start a podcast to like sell for 60 minutes every week. You start a podcast to provide the value that will eventually create the community and build your brand enough to um, drive inbound opportunities in the future. But that goes as long as you're not pushing that proactively. Uh, like we, like we, when we do the Q and A, we're, we're not asking, like we're not getting a question answering and then pitching our services. We just try to help. So, so I think that's an important, the, the biggest success of a podcast uh, host or a company or a personal brand is the mindset and mentality behind it, not the actual podcast. And, and I think that's what the biggest key driver in, in terms of whether a podcast is going to be successful for their KPIs or not. Um, I, I have a, a follow-up question that I was asking yesterday with a, a potential client of us where he's trying to build a media company, right? So, so he has a good personal brand and he's going to utilize that to, to build a media company in terms of like creating content across um, long form articles and like YouTube shows and all that. So a different ways, different types of content. Uh, but he was struggling with finding a way to monetize it. So he was looking for help in terms of how do I monetize this community or this, he has a followership already. So how do I transform that into a media company and how do I monetize it? So I, I wanted to hear your thoughts about how can media companies uh, monetize it? Because now we're, we're seeing this thought that every company needs to be a media company, right? But creating content is not just the, the one way to like make that work. So how do you, how do you monetize a media company? I cannot say that I have experience in in this area, but I can. I, I, I can think you try do. To... I, I think you kind of do because, like, a personal brand is a media company as well. Right? Yeah, that's that's what I what I wanted to say. Like, yeah, you know, in a way, uh, I mean, it all depends. Like, it's um, when we are talking about media company, like, do they have like the equipment to? to create content right because if if they do that's the first thing that that they can do if what they are doing for themselves they can do for somebody else just sell that that's like the easiest way to go when it comes to that yeah i mean when he was talking about media company he was looking think of something like entrepreneur or like uh the hustle the newsletter or like it's not of like them creating necessarily content for other people. It's being like a bit of a curator and trying to find like um, ways to monetize that, that community that he's built on his personal brand and just putting it under a different name. I, I don't think that's a big, big change. Hmm. Basically, look, uh, what I mentioned. You got me. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, well, you, re you re reminded me of. Uh, of some things that I that I use an example in in a, in a presentation when I was talking about utilization of email marketing and the newsletter. Yeah. So um, there are a few people that uh, have built um, all their businesses all based on a, on a newsletter like content. Yeah. Uh, one of them is like we all know him is Gary Vee because he started like creating videos after videos every single day you know he started just with a with a bottle of wine yep then he like figured out that he cannot drink like two or three bottles a night he need to do something else because if he likes the wine somebody else might not like it so he was talking about the wine in different ways then he was somebody who loves sports so he bring brought out the personality but he was there day after day day after day and that's how uh each day he brought something new and he uh created the audience i mean it was the early days of the youtube but 
anyway, there was also a guy uh, from, uh, I don't know, some Nordic country who uh, was trying to, to sell fish. There's a specific, I don't know, uh, dish he creates out of out of fish. He was like two an hour something, and he was trying to sell it. But it was just one of them over there. So he said, "Let's change strategy a little bit." So every day, I'm gonna present a specific dish that consists of of that thing that I'm selling. So how can you make a lunch, a breakfast, a dinner? Uh, and day by day, people uh, slowly got hooked to that because he's not only talking about his product, he's showing them how to use it, how to eat healthy, how to create different kind of uh, dishes, how to do something like And it grew from a small country to wide. It really blew up the product just because he's here every day. It doesn't need to be like uh, email. It can be Instagram, right? It can be something else. You just need to find a platform when you are showing up. It doesn't even have to be each day. It all depends on a platform and uh, how long does it take for you to create to create the content. There's a huge brand called Amazon Kitchen on YouTube. Um, we found out they are from Serbia only when they became popular. And basically, what are they doing? So. They are just, there are no people in the video. So they are just coming to the forest near the river uh, using old wooden materials to um, first sharpen up the night, everything. Like the sound is amazing. And there are also like nature sounds. You can, you can hear the grasshoppers, everything. And then you can hear how the dish is boiling how everything is cooking. Like it makes you just want to quit the video and go out and prepare something. Right. And just by doing that, they didn't do anything else. They just create video after video, video after video. Now they're, they had uh, huge sponsorships from, other, I don't know, I would probably say uh, the wrong name of the company, but it's a huge uh, automobile brand, automotive. So basically, they are now coming to the location using that car and those kind of things. And they like grew day by day. Sometimes now they appear in the video, but it's like, um, I don't know how many millions they have now, but it's a huge, huge uh, audience. And it's just basically so simple. Yeah, part of the audience is Milena, because Milena apparently... Yeah. What is it for? Yeah, man, I will, I will send you one video and that's it. You're hooked. <laughs> so, so you mentioned brand and that's one of the questions that I sent over over the week. And one of the biggest discussions on Twitter right now that I saw, which was the question of can a brand be the moat that defends your company from your competitors? So can you just build a better brand and use that as your differentiator factor that makes you win versus competitors, or there needs to be something there, something more technical, something more um, that's cost effective or, or another type of mode that can separate you. Is brand enough? Is brand a mode? Hmm. Yeah, is it done? Yeah. Um, it's an interesting question. It, it's not an and easy one for sure. Yeah, and look like uh, we can just say brand is enough, but if you if you cannot uh, deliver, then like you you are creating your brand out of uh, out of thin air. But usually, if you already have an established brand, it means that you are already an authority. And it means that you have proven things up. I mean, if you're just starting to create the brand and you're trying to uh, to get um, ahead of your competitors just because they are not doing anything and you're just doing that, 
that's okay. But in the long run, if you uh, are able to create uh, a brand around yourself, around your company, you create a brand based of, uh, on authority and based on what you can do, not about around what you can say, right? right? So I think that brings us to that like brand is enough in that case. Yeah, I, I think the, the key that where you mentioned that is there's a difference between building a brand and building hype or momentum, right? Like the, it's easy to build hype. Well, easy. It, hype can be built on the short term. A brand is something that you build on the long term, right? So I remember there was this um, competitor of, of Shopify who was run by a good friend of mine uh, as the CMO. And they built great hype because they were really good marketers and, and they built great momentum coming into their lunch day. And then because on the technical side, the company actually didn't work, like the, the product was not well built, then the company failed. So they didn't have brand yet. They had hype, they had momentum. But the, and they built that over two or three months. It, it's impossible to build a brand over two or three months. I think hype cannot be a, a moat, right? Hype is something that you ha can have and you can create but that it's not uh, sustainable over the long term um, or doesn't have to be. But when you build a brand, I think that can definitely be a moat. Right? Like, I don't know the difference between, I don't think Nike does better shoes than Adidas, but I'm never buying Adidas. Like I'll never buy an Adidas pair of shoes ever because Nike is my brand, right? Like I, I like iPhone, I, I like Apple more than Samsung and I'll buy Apple always but is Apple better than Samsung? I'm not sure. I think in some ways they probably are, but at least from a product standpoint and from a company standpoint, they're competing, right? Like they're, they're up there. Uh, and they've built that brand over the long term. Nike has built brand over the long term, Apple has. So uh, a sustainable brand is something that can really be a differentiator and probably one of the most important assets that a company can ever have but it's not the same as building hype or building momentum and then your company not being up to the standard that you're saying from your marketing standpoint that it is. Yeah, when it comes to both things, like company having both building a brand and building a high hype constantly over time, the first company that comes to my mind is Tesla. Right. Like they have built a brand and they are building the hype with each new product. Yeah, they, they build hype when they want it. But the brand exactly. stays there, you know, like the, the, they can find the specific moments of hype, but they have a long term branding that allows them to to create that consistency and be able to like speed it up whenever needed. Um, but their products is actually another mode that they have, for example. Right. So, so they have like their brand is a mode. It's not the only mode, but, but it's definitely one of them and one of the biggest key is for, the, for their marketing success as well. Yep. Hey guys, I don't mean to yeah. interfere. No, yeah, no, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to call you out and say welcome and ask if you have any questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, well, I just got in. I think I got the email you guys. I don't know why I got the phone. But um, Amilfi, thanks for having me. And while I was listening to you guys speaking about about um, the brand, I just read a tweet by Matthew Kobach. And he says, in the past week alone, I've had half a dozen CEOs, founders, ask me if I know any great community builders. So then, uh, does it mean that um, part of it would be building a personal brand or building a community first around your product or around your offering? Or do you think we should go with a personal brand before the community or, or like, no, I'm just wondering. Yeah. yeah. And then someone has a question. Okay, can, can you go ahead? Can you go ahead? I, I couldn't hear you well, but Nemanja, did, did, you, did you get that? Yeah. Um, the question was, uh, should we go first with creating the community or the personal brand should be the first? Okay. What, what, what do you think about that? I'm just thinking about uh, 
what happened with in my case. Okay. Like uh, I I th I think I I created a community around something first. I don't know if that's if that's that's the answer, but this is how it happens. I mean, um, having a personal brand before creating a community, and I think community is uh, is really good if we can create it before we even have a product or a service. Uh, so having a good personal brand can only help us create a better community because people know us and can join the community based on that. Right. I, I think also the question here, and maybe that's like for another day because that can be like a one hour long conversation. It's like, what's the difference between community and audience? Right. Like, I, I do think there's a, a nuance there between audience and community. Right? I think I have an audience, but I don't think I have a community there. Um, but, but from, from our work with our clients, I, I think the, the key here is they're not one first then the other, one, the other, the other first. I think a good personal brand focuses on building a community, right? I think they're intertwined that they, they scale one another. So when you're creating content and becoming a thought leader, you're building your personal brand. But when you're engaging with the community and when you are, um, replying to comments and in, replying to other people's posts and trying to engage with different individuals, that's when you create the community as well. Uh, so, so I think they, need, they go together and a good personal brand that has not created community is probably not that good of a personal brand because if you were, you'd have a community of people who actually engage with you, who care about you and who just do more than, than, than just listen. Right? A thought leader gets people that listen. A good personal brand gets a community as well. I don't know if that answers a little bit the question or... Yes, thank you very much. Awesome. You said you had another one or... That, 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 uh, that, that oh, was it. That? Someone asked a reply that, that says, um, does that mean CEO is founders are looking to hire people who can build community around their business or products? So then that was when I, I thought about um, Russell Branson and then ClickFunnels, the whole community of Avengers people in yeah by the way thanks for the question the answer sorry yeah, yeah he, he did a good job with uh with the community there because he, he was able to create a, a really engaged community that would then buy the product and become really loyal to it so like the click funnel community is something that is definitely worth the study whether you like the product or not he did a great job with like um making them very engaged and very loyal for a software company I like it. it's a software comp nobody's really that loyal usually for a software company like nobody wears t-shirts of like i don't know uh, slack right like we don't do that but but they did a great job on creating that community as a SaaS company i think uh, and like you can see the final really clear on their end like for example he put out those books who were like free plus shipping those books are good as well like these were actually good books and, and then you get you can see the each step across the final I think that it's, he's definitely worth a case study. I should write about him one day because he did a great job. I don't really like him personally, but but he he is like really smart on what he's doing. He created uh, an awesome community around the average product. That's how exactly. how I see it. How exactly. I see it. I mean, the books are great. He's also uh, getting. I think he maybe started first. That I don't know but it was a long time since I, I was listening to his podcast and like uh, listening to the way he did some things, but he had this thing if um, somebody started to use like click funnels, funnels he has a, a challenge or something that's follow up, you know, like, yeah. uh, and that's how you really engage people. And also like now the, then the books are coming and all the other things and they're organizing like some huge charity events where people can, can call like all kind of different things and all have the same goal and the goal is engage. Yeah. And so something he did as well uh, was like taking ownership of a segment, right? Like he, when he, I'm not saying he named the final concept or that he invented it, but he was the one that really popularized it or on the last decade. 
right? So, so being able to like own that segment and being the person like who kind of named it is something that uh, added tremendous value to him. Because when you think cl- funnels, you think click funnels and you think him. I'm sure there's other people, but he was the one that really owned that segment from a personal brand standpoint and from a company standpoint. But the product sucks, by the way. Fuck, ClickFunnels is a yeah. piece of shit. Like, I hate that. There's, there's one example I want to share. Like, when I first got into the performance marketing agency, one of the first books that I got to read was, uh, was Russell Bronson's book. And it's a great book. It really shows you how it goes through the funnels and what should be in each email and those kind of things. Yeah, it's a great so book, for sure. The owner said, the, the owner said to me, Okay, let's write a couple of emails for a client. Let's experiment and use uh, Russell Bronson's techniques. So I did it. And he likes these long emails when you have like CTAs in PS, when you have all kind of things. And I did it all by the book. And the CEO said, cut this off in half. It's too long. <laughs> right. Like, I was like, okay, if we are doing it, we're doing it. It's Serbia, man. I said, okay, but like, so that's how I started my, my journey in performance marketing and learning how to write email marketing, you know? So I, I, tr- I didn't even get a chance to, to implement something and to see if it works or not. I mean, I had a chance to do it a bit later, but it reminds me of how not to start educating someone. Yeah, I, I think his, his book, sorry, I, I put your link over there. Um, but like, his book touched on a few different things that whether you're a marketer or salespeople, I do think there's some values and lessons that you can get out of it. I remember like he, one of the first books he like wrote about how to tell a story to keep it engaged and keep it cohesive. And that's something that I still use like these days and like when I'm trying to write copy or whatever that, whatever that is. Um, so, so definitely worth reading. And I think those are, Good books, great community, shitty product. Do you have any other questions, Nemanja, that you, you'd like to touch on or anything else? I think you're muted, man. Yeah, sorry. I muted myself because I need to answer to someone from my team. Um, there is one thing that... Uh, that got to my mind and it's um, like I, I thought that we are over with that but it still keeps coming up and the topic is uh, why do CEOs keep interfering in, tw- in what people in charge for the content for the marketing are doing if they don't uh, want to take a look at the stats and conclude based on that like they mm-hmm. They just listen to somebody from outside and they say, oh, now your audience is there. So we are going to go all in there. Like Facebook, Instagram, it's like something that can be uh, do as a lifestyle. LinkedIn is a way to get to get customers. Yeah. And it's not always the truth. It's, it just depends on, uh, on, uh, on what you're doing. When do you need it? If you need something to happen really quick, then sometimes LinkedIn in most cases is not, is not the first thing if you're not using LinkedIn ads or something like that. Yes. So the question is, why do they interfere? Why do CEOs interfere? Yeah. Uh, no, uh, the question is, will it stop? The, the answer is no. And, and the answer to why is because they have huge egos. They think they know better than everybody. And they think that they know more about marketing than the marketing team. They think they know more about sales than the sales team. And if they could do everything, they would do it. Because they're also like psycho, full control, micromanagement type of guys. That's the bad ones. Like the good ones are the opposite. But but I work with many of them. Usually the ones that we work with are completely not that. Like they're actually really, uh, they understand who the expert is in what area. But CEOs as a whole, they're usually like that. They're usually uh, self-absorbed and have a huge amount of confidence and thinking that they know better and they usually don't know better. 
So it's our job as agencies, the salespeople here, the marketing people here, to communicate that with them and trying to find ways to um, manage that situation, manage those expectations, and try to still have the th- stay in control of, of the process as much as you can or, or get out of the company, right? But, but I do think this, this comes from a, from a mindset of like, I want to micromanage everything and it's not, not going to stop because that's who people, CEOs are as, as a trend. I'm not saying all of them, but I'm saying usually that's how they are. I mean, I'm a bit like that and I, I'm sure you're a bit like that as well. And, and it, it is what it is. Right? Like we just have to find a ways to make it work. Yeah, I mean, this was strange to me because, um, like, it comes to the point when they don't care for like a f- couple of months, then they get engaged. They they want to go in a totally different way, no matter what are the results, previous results, what what happened here, what are the costs. Then you can tell them like, you don't have money for some of these things, and they're like, okay, but let's still do it, like. You cannot do it. There are right. some things that you can or you can't do. And I mean, I, I know that this is a never ending story, but I uh, just wanted to clear my head and, and speak some things out. Yeah, I just think this, this happens everywhere, right? Like, I think the, the marketers that are here right now, like they probably have a manager that struggles with that and a CEO that struggles with that, whoever you, they, you, they, they report that to. Uh, and it just, it's a never ending story. And honestly, it's probably, I've given up on like trying to understand why. Like sometimes they see a Facebook ad that some fake guru put out that Facebook ads are the go-to thing and then they change their whole mind just because of that Facebook ad. So, so it is what it is. You just have to like try to uh, manage that conversation and trying to stay in control. But, but it's definitely a fight and it's not going away anytime soon, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. Man, it's been a good conversation. Awesome, brother. Uh, if, if we don't have any questions, we can um, set up the one for next week. Uh, yeah, I think we, if, if we don't have uh, Anna join us and talking about product marketing, which was the, the question like a week ago, but I wanted to get somebody who who's in that daily and yeah. Marty and me can can just uh, spark the conversation and get it going. But if it's not happening next week, because Anna was trying to get outside of Serbia and to, to get to the sea, probably she did because she didn't message me. So if not that, I think we can go with the, with the topic that we mentioned about what was uh, community. Yeah, audience versus community. Yeah, I think that would be really great. Awesome, brother. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us to another episode. It's always great to have you here. Uh, we, we really appreciate your time, and we hope this is a, a valuable hour for the week. And we'll see you guys next Wednesday, 6 p.m. Uh, European time, Central European. Mm-hmm.